Good morning. I do want to welcome you again to Southside Bible Church. Let's uh, go ahead and open in prayer and get started. (laughs) Heavenly Father, it is with great gratitude that we all bow our hearts to you this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to be here, to assemble together, to praise and worship your name, to sing to you, to to listen and receive your word, to think on your truth. May your spirit visit your word. May your spirit use the words of your servant that you might be upheld, that you might be proclaimed, that you might be glorified, that you might be all in all. And even this morning, if there are those here who do not know you, may today be the day of salvation for them. May you open their eyes. May you show them the excellence of our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ. Be with us now as we look into your word. It's in your precious son's name we pray. Amen. So as I said, um, if you haven't already, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're going to be looking at verses 16 to 18, very succinct verses. Um, Usually, as we read through these, they tend to strike kind of a funny chord. Uh, Verse 16 says, rejoice always. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. Verse 18, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And at first blush, we might read over these in multiple different ways. Um, If you were reading this, having very little background in the Bible, you might say, rejoice always, that's absurd. Pray without ceasing, that's impossible. Be thankful for all things that's excessive. And yeah, that'd probably be a correct response, but we need the background to, to this. And, and who's writing and who's being written to? So we're gonna look at that. But the other thought is, I would say more in Christian circles, that as we approach these passages, we say these are hyperbolic. They're, they're overreaching. And, and so we're just, what, what God is doing is putting something out there that's really high in hopes that not necessarily that we would attain to them, but that we would reach as, as far as he wants us to. And if that's the case, what we have done is turn God into a manipulator. We've reduced his character and we've had, we have eliminated his sovereignty. So it's very severe if we don't actually step into these passages and say, no, this says what it says. And God means what he says by his Holy Spirit, the scriptures being God breathed. And so if that is true, then what does this really mean? And and what do I need to do to truly look at this and apply it to my life? So first, let's, let's give a little background because we are stepping into a book. Uh, Ken's been in First Peter, so this is quite a different book and quite a different author. So this is Paul's letter to the people of Thessalonica, or the Thess- Thessalonians. Um, who are they? What's the background? Well, you're going to get the majority of that in Acts 18. Uh, sorry, Acts 17. Acts 17. That's where, where you're going to get the majority of what's going on. I'll just, by way of uh, quickly going through the history there, we are going to visit some of the passages in Acts 17. But essentially, Paul and, and Silas, they're on that second missionary journey. You remember those names the most probably from their visit to Philippi, and where they're uh, put into jail in Philippi and Uh, Lydia's in Philippi and all of those things that unfold in Philippi. Well, from Philippi, they make their way into Thessalonica. And in in Thessalonica, there uh, there was a Jewish 
uh, presence there, which means there was a synagogue, and as was the practice, they went to the synagogue and proclaimed the things of Jesus Christ. They would take the Old Testament and show that Jesus Christ was indeed uh, the Messiah spoken of. And there were prominent people who believed and received the word. But as was common, commonplace for uh, the missions trips that Paul would go on, it would also stir up strife in that there was jealousy. There was jealousy from the Jewish leaders saying, eh, you know, uh-oh, people aren't going to be following us anymore. We're going to lose our power base and et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, they stirred up the crowd. They got a bunch of thugs out of the marketplace and went to a man's house, a man uh, by the name of Jason. Jason would be a very wealthy, prominent man. How do I know? Because he has a house. And you're like, well, big deal. So does everybody in America. Well, this isn't 21st century America. Back then, there was a 90-10 split. There were two classes, the haves and the haves not, have-nots. You want to get, guess which was the 90%? It was the have-nots. It was the very, very uh, poor. And then everybody else was, was wealthy. That other 10% was wealthy. They were the ones that had the jobs, and they had the servants, and et cetera. And so he was a wealthy, prominent person. They get him, they drag him into, into court. And uh, the, uh, the offici officiants were a little concerned because uh, Thessalonica was kind of an independent city that had its own governing bodies. It wasn't wholly uh, taken over by the Roman Empire. The Romans kind of let them alone because they were fine. But if that city was to get out of control, guess what would happen? Being engulfed in the Roman Empire, Want to take a guess? The Romans were known for their kindness and mercy. Uh, they would send a large cohort in there and they would settle it down really quick. So they were very concerned about that. These leaders were very concerned about that. And thus, they, they said, okay, let's take a pledge. That would be a financial pledge from Jason that, that hey, it's going to be fine. It's going to calm down. And Paul and Silas decided to leave. Why? Because had things continued thusly, it probably would have continued to stir up the crowd and it would have cost Jason. And, and I'm sure Jason's response is, what's money, I don't care. But Paul and Silas, being men of God, said, look, we, no, we don't want this to cost you. And so they move on and they moved on to Berea. And they move as far as Athens and you, will, you actually see this, if you read through Acts 17 and then come in and read the book of Thessalonians, you'll see a lot of, oh yeah, this connects. It connects up beautifully. So Paul, what is the book about? Um, there is uh, some eschatology in the book, and a lot of people say since there's so much eschatology mentioned, it's, an eschato uh, it's a book about eschatology. Well, no, not really. It's, it's more a book uh, of ecclesiology. It's a book written to the church. We really see Paul's heart for the church um, in... In, uh, throughout the book in 1 Thessalonians. Look at 1 Thessalonians 3, um, verses 1 through 4. It says, Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. You'll see that in Acts 17. And, and we, we sent Timothy, our brother. In, in Acts 17, you see that they sent for Timothy, and then they sent, sent Timothy to the uh, Thessalonians. Um, Timothy, our brother, and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith so that no one would be disrupted by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this, affliction, the hardship. For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction, and so it came to pass, as you know. So uh, you, you notice that, that he mentions affliction. He, mention, he mentions their affliction, Paul and Silas, and he mentions the affliction on the Thessalonians. So I want you to carry that thought, and, and also you should hear Paul's concern, right? His heart is for the church there, and that's why this letter is here. And chapters four and five are, are instructions to the church. So, so hear that. This is an ecclesial, uh, ecclesiological epistle. I have a desire for the church to hear and to know. Okay? But what you should also bring into these passages is he mentions 
We had affliction, you have affliction. Now, unless the word affliction meant something different to them, these passages with rejoice always, be thankful in everything, should already tell you that this, this has to be deeper than happy times. If they're in the midst of suffering, this has got to be something more than just some circumstantial peace. So with those thoughts in mind, I want us to think about this uh, Sunday school teacher who asked her class what they were thankful for. And one little boy said, my glasses. And when asked why he was thankful for his glasses, when most little boys were bitter about wearing them, he said, because they keep the boys from fighting and the girls from kissing me. <laughs> so sometimes thankfulness is, is a matter of perspective. And that's what we're gonna really see. So the first statement here is actually rejoice always. All right, so in the English, it's rejoice always. In the Greek, it's always rejoice. Always rejoice. Well, in the Greek, whatever comes first is, is what's being emphasized. So we, we read this with rejoice always, and we're like, well, he means rejoice. He must mean something different by always. Well, if he, he intended that, he would have said rejoice always. But no, he says always Rejoice, always, panto te, always, and then kairo, rejoice. It's, this is a word used 75 times in 65 verses. We've got a very clear understanding of what this is because it's mentioned all throughout the scriptures. So as we've mentioned before, these guys know what affliction is. Paul was familiar with affliction. Look at 2 Corinthians 6.10. 2 Corinthians 6.10. You know, maybe, maybe Paul knows, uh, you know, there's joy and then there's, there's difficulty or hardship and these are, uh, are, are different types of things. And so, um, so he couldn't possibly mean what he's saying here. So 2 Corinthians 6, 4 and 5. But in everything commending ourselves as servants of God in much endurance, in, aff in afflictions, in hardship, in distress. Sounds pretty rough to me. In beatings, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in hunger, in purity, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in genuine love. In the word of truth. Um, uh, uh, oh, uh, um, in, in the word of truth, in power, in the power of God, by weapons of the right, righteousness for the right hand and the left, by glory and dishonor, by evil report and good report, regard, regarded as deceivers and yet true, as unknown yet well known, as dying yet beholding, we live as punished yet not put to death. So sorrowful, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich. So all the way to verse 10. Do you see that? As sorrowful, Yet, again, what do we have? Always rejoicing. Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. So that right there already says, Paul's familiar with this. He was a man of affliction. He was a man familiar with sorrow. There was another man familiar with sorrow. Christ himself, familiar with sorrow, knew sorrow. But, but um, we're told in Galatians 5.20 that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, etc. And since we know the Trinity is one, one God, was, G was Jesus Christ ever without joy? And if we reflect on that, no. He would always have joy, but he was a man acquainted with sorrow. So we know that these things aren't opposites. They coexist. It's just that our, we have a misunderstanding societally about what joy and rejoicing are. And it tends to be wrapped around our circumstances, right? Christmas day comes and I get what I want, there's joy. Christmas day comes and I get underwear and socks, no joy. So that's the way we tend to think because we use those words. And yet we want to understand these, these biblical principles as what it is to always rejoice. So we see Paul there, he's familiar with this. 
Um, how about James? In James 1, t- uh, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 2, what does he say? Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter what? Various trials. Well, uh, and Ken preached on this about four years ago as he preached the book of James. Um, all various kinds of trials and difficulties and hardships, and, and he's saying, consider it joy, well, why would I consider it joy? So we should be happy about hard things. We should be happy about being abused. We should be happy about not getting the promotion. We should be happy about these things. Um, and, and that's not it because you, you read further. Why, why are we joying? Why are we rejoicing in various trials? Verse three, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing. So these trials are bringing about in us, in in the context of James, Christ in our lives, right? That we might be transformed in his image. So there is joy in that, right? So joy has to be, or this rejoicing has to be something more than just superficial. True joy and rejoicing comes from the Holy Spirit of God. Again, going back to Galatians 5.22 with uh, the fruit of the Spirit being love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. So it has to be something more. And it is something more. So, so what, what's at the heart of this? And then kind of what, is the, what are the differentiating factors between rejoicing and then thankfulness? Because the statements about thankfulness, as we're going to see, are slightly different than those of rejoicing. We are to always rejoice. And what is it that we're really joying in? And I'm going to assert to you that what we're really joying in is who God is and what he has done. Who God is and what he has done. So I, we're going to look at several passages and, and what, what it is to joy and rejoice in either who God is or what he's done. Um, look with me at Psalm 28, 6 through 7. Psalms 28, 6, verses 6 and 7. Blessed be the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart exalts. And with, and, and with my song, I shall thank him. So we, say, we see the, uh, the psalmist here rejoicing in God's righteous character. He can count on him. He can uphold him. Uh, this is, doesn't mean he's going to get us out of every difficulty. It means that we can count on God to always be God. And if we know that God is good and right, what will he always do? That which is good and right. It just might not be from our perspective. And we need to take our eyes off of our circumstances, our situations, and ourselves and turn them to the God of the Bible and find there who God is. So uh, we also glory in Romans 5, 1 through 2, verses 1 and 2, that we are redeemed by Christ. This is what Christ has done, the second person of the Trinity. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through who? Our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we what? Exult in the hope of the glory of God. And then verse 11 And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. We have been reconciled to God through Christ. We rejoice. And I'm going to ask you, when should we stop rejoicing in that? And I think we should agree that the answer is never. If you know Christ, if you have come to Christ, you can lose sight of this, yes. 
But when you gain sight of it again and go, whoops, I forgot, you will remember anew and say, thank you. I, I really rejoice over the fact that you have made me right with God because there is no other way to be right with God. Jesus Christ is it. And so those of you who have come to Christ, if, if you have forgotten this, remember it anew. Jesus Christ has redeemed you. Rejoice in that. If you do not know Christ, there is no other way to be right with him. If you do not know this Lord, this Savior, and you are wondering how on earth do I pursue a right relationship with the God of the universe? One way, through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. Come to him today. As 1 Corinthians says, today is the day of salvation. Let it be today for you that you might rejoice also with those who are here rejoicing in the fact that we are redeemed by Christ. Uh, Romans 14, Romans 14, 17 is another cause for rejoicing. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And joy in the Holy Spirit. So we rejoice in the ministry of the, of the Holy Spirit on our behalf. He's there. Guys, when you came to know Christ, you gained the third person of the Trinity ever present in your life. And that is great cause for rejoicing. In Ephesians 1, 3, verses 3 through 6, we rejoice in our spiritual blessings. Um, let's turn there real, just real quick because it's, it's something that, that should make our hearts joyful. Ephesians chapter one, verses three through six. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has what? Blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And it continues. We, we not only were made right with God, we not only gain this Holy Spirit, but we are blessed with every spiritual blessing. Bad pastor. <laughs> so we are blessed with every spiritual blessing. He withholds none. We earned and deserve none of it. And we gain all of it. Let us rejoice. Romans 8, 28 through 30. We rejoice in the fact that God is working all things out for the highest possible good. If there were a better way to do it, he would have done it. And so what he is doing, we rejoice in because it's, we know, we know by faith, it's the best possible outcome. Philippians 1, 18 through 21, and Philippians 3, 20, we exult, we exult in our future glory in Christ. So not only do we gain a right relationship with God, not only do we gain the Holy Spirit, not only do we gain spiritual blessing, but we gain Christ in glory forever. The very thing that our heart wants. In John 16, 24, um, as uh, the high priestly prayer, as Christ is, is praying to the Father, in, in that we, we rejoice that we can confidently ask for those things that are in accordance with his will and they will be answered. Right? We're told also in 1 Thessalonians 2, this is the will of God, your sanctification. I guarantee you that if you pray for sanctification, you will get it. Now, the, the means by which God uses to accomplish that, you might not be thrilled with. But he will do it. 
I'm, and and let, let's be careful with John 16, 24. It says, you know, I'm, I'm going to answer whatever you ask for. Well, I'm asking for the Ferrari and it's still not in my driveway. Well, you're not asking according to God's will. Let's ask. We can rejoice in asking things in accordance with God's will. Lord, make me a, a person that rejoices always. As we're going to see, this is the will of God. He's going to answer that. So we can rejoice in the fact that he does answer. Psalm 119, verses 14 and verses 111. We can rejoice in having the word of God. We take it for granted because we're in 21st century America. There's a, a Bible just about everywhere. You go to a hotel and you forgot yours. It's fine. There's two, one in both bedside corners. And we lose the joy in the fact that we have the word of God, objective truth, that God so loved us that he would give his word, not only his son, not only himself, not only his spirit, not only the gifts, not only the glory, but his word. And you see, it's covering all gamuts, past, present, future. We can rejoice in these things. Uh, 2 Timothy 1, uh, verses 3 through 4, Philemon uh, 7, 2 John 12, we can rejoice in the privilege of Christ-centered fellowship. Another thing that sometimes we take for granted, he's given us the body of Christ to bless each other, to help each other, to encourage one another as the day draws near, to rejoice with one another as we all rejoice together. So we rejoice in the privilege of Christ-centered fellowship. So finally, I just and, and, and that's not even an exhaustive list. I, I don't have time to go into an exhaustive list. There's so much that we can rejoice in that God has given us. It's, it's that we're not in the word and we're not filling our hearts and our minds with these things over and over again, reminding our hearts of what we have in Christ Jesus, what we have in God. So much to rejoice in, even in the midst of affliction and hardship and suffering. Well, someone might say, well, what is it? Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, see? See, there's no rejoicing. There's the opposite of rejoicing. It's weeping. And here's what I would say. There's still rejoicing, even in the midst of tears. Do, do all the things that we have mentioned suddenly go away in trial and difficulty? Does hardship suddenly make all of these things go away? And our answer is no. They're still there. So I can still rejoice in my tears as I weep and do weep with those who weep. And we'll, we'll go into kind of thankfulness and prayer in a minute. So that's to kind of answer that question. But John 11.35 is, is touted as the shortest verse in the Bible, which is true. Um, it's Jesus wept. Jesus wept. And it's, uh, it is the shortest verse in the Bible in English. It is actually the, not the shortest verse in the Bible in the Greek. The shortest verse in the Bible in Greek is this verse. 1 Thessalonians 5.16. Rejoice always. You go, that's an interesting little piece of trivia, Nate. Why did you bring it up? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Those thoughts are connected. Jesus wept because of the cross that he was going to bear, because of the separation that he was going to face from his father. Jesus wept because we were going to be redeemed. And that is our cause for rejoicing. So Jesus wept, and thus we rejoice always. Remember to link those two. Those are two beautiful thoughts. So verse 17, verse 17 of 1 Thessalonians, pray 
without ceasing. And this is where people go, oh boy. Um, as, as my dad uh, told me a story once, and he was first a believer, he, uh, he and a, a brother of his, a brother in Christ, were driving, and uh, the, the man mentioned, well, let's pray about that. And, uh, and my father bowed his head, closed his eyes, folded his hands, and pray, prayed, and then the other man prayed, and then my dad unfolded his hands, opened his eyes, and put his head up. And he turned to the man and he said, um, as we were crossing that bridge, were you just trusting God to guide the car or with your eyes closed and head bowed? Or, or did you have your eyes open? Which kind of communicates something that, that we have these presuppositions about prayer. That prayer is a posture, right? You close your eyes, you bow your head, you fold your hands, and that's what prayer is. No, that's just a posture. But that's not what prayer is. And so... If we carry this posture situation into, our, into this verse with pray without ceasing, it's like, I, I've got a job to do. I got people I got to relate to. I'm told to use my spiritual gifts. How can I pray without ceasing and have this posture? It's because that's not what prayer is. That's what we need to um, make sure that we understand. So the first thing that we do need to understand is that this is a command. Same as rejoice always, by the way. That's an, it's an imperative. Do it. So, so at least now we've got our, our arms around what rejoicing looks like and why we, we can and should rejoice always. What about this pray without ceasing? Continual. Well, if we define prayer as communion with God, communion with God, now we've got a better understanding. Can I commune with God and do all the things that I mentioned? Can I commune with God and work? Can I commune with God and serve? Can I commune with God and weep with those who weep? Can I commune with God, et cetera, et cetera? The answer is yes, I can. Well, uh, you know, but you're, you're giving examples of activities, and I heard there's different kinds of prayer. Well, yeah, there, there are, and there's plenty of examples of them. Um, there's, there can be prayer of submission, Matthew 6, 5 through 6. Prayer of supplication, Mark eleven twenty four. Prayer of confession, 1 John 1, 9. Um, prayer of uh, intercession, Numbers 21, 7. Romans 8, 34. Prayers of praise, Hebrews 13, 15. Prayers of thanksgiving, Psalm 26, 7. Philippians 4, 7. And, and the list goes on. There's, there's tons of different types of prayers, right? So if we limit ourselves to one type of praying, it's just you, you say words to God. Then it's like, well, what if I'm hurting? Well, what if I'm in sin? Well, what if I'm in, that's why... There's all different types of prayers because there's all different types of communing with God. And so there are three other verses that help us with this thought of uh, prayer without ceasing. Let's, let's look at, at these three other verses to kind of help us with uh, kind of the way Paul communicates these things. So turn with me to Romans 1.9. And the word prayer is used, you know, 90 times, 82 verses. It's used all over the place. But this, this thought of, of praying always is, uh, those thoughts together are slightly different, narrows it down a little bit. For God, whom I serve in my spirit, in the preaching of the gospel of his son, is my witness of how, what, I unceasingly, unceasingly I make mention of you, always in my prayers, making request, if perhaps now, at last, by the will of God, I may succeed in coming to you. Was he constantly going around saying, please help me go, 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 please help me go? That would be repetition. And that's not what prayer is, repetition. Um, in Ecclesiastes 5, 1 through 2, it says, basically tells us to be uh, 
respectful as we are approaching God and actually to make our words few. Uh, Ecclesiastes 5, 1 through 2 says, Guard your steps as you go to the house of God and draw near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know what they, are doing, uh, that they, what they are doing is evil. Do not be hasty in word or impulse in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God, for God is in heaven and you are on earth, therefore let your words be few. So there's this thought of carefulness with your words with God, not flippantness. And it doesn't need to be repetitive, Matthew 6, 7. That's how the Gentiles pray. With repetition, over and over and over again. Why? Because that's the way they thought they got the pagan gods' attention. You said something over and over and over and over again, you would get their attention, and then they would finally hear your request. That's not our God. Does he not know the thoughts and words and, and desires of your heart before they're even there for you? Now, it's not to say don't say them, do say them. But here's Paul with his petition, right? What we're seeing is that as, as often as these people were brought to his mind, the Romans, he was praying. I want to come, please open the door that I might be able to come. Please open the door that I might be able to come. He's, he's, that's his consistent petition. First Thessalonians, so the book in which we are currently, uh, chapter 1, verse 3. We see it again. Constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father. Did I write my verse down right? I guess not. Oh, verse 2. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers. We give thanks to God always. Well, was he... We're always, always saying... Thank you, God, for the Thessalonians. Thank you, God, for the Thessalonians. Thank you, God, for the Thessalonians. Uh, don't interrupt me right now. I can't talk to you. I'm thanking God for the Thessalonians. No. It's as oft as they came to his mind, he was thanking God for them. As oft as he prayed, he was thanking God for them. And then again in uh, chapter 2, verse 13. For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but for what, is, but what it really is, the work of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. He was, how often? Constantly thanking God for them, consistently, over and over and over again. So what is it then to pray without ceasing? Does there always, uh, do I always need to have words? Well, we're, we're, we see that uh, the Spirit in Ephesians, um, the Spirit intercedes for us for groanings too deep for word, with groanings too deep for words. Well, too deep for what? For words. And sometimes there are no words. Have you ever experienced great pain or loss for which there are no words? I know there are people in here that have. Sometimes there are no words. So if prayer has to involve words, then this prayer without ceasing, we're, we're running into a problem, a difficulty. So it has to be something deeper than just words, right? It's actually the heart, the very heart of us towards God. And sometimes there are no words. But there is a heart of humility, a heart that's just crying out to God. So thus to pray without ceasing is a call and remember who it is that we are in and who it is that we walk in. We're, we're told in Ephesians 5.18, right? Be filled with the Spirit. How often should we be filled with the Spirit? On occasion when we feel like it, on the good days. No. That command, be filled, is a continual and it's an imperative again. It's an always thing. So that communion with us and God should be ever present. That's the command. Should be ever present. Whether there are words or not, there should be a heart attitude 
of submission and, and, if you will, the phrase on praying grounds at all times, even when there's not words. So our, our third verse, verse 18, in everything give thanks. And the first thing I want to say is, okay, so how does this differ from rejoicing? Well, it's in how it's structured. It says, in each and everything, that's the Greek, in each and everything, again, this is, this is the preceding thankfulness. In each and everything, thankfulness. And so when, when do we see that? Remember, we're talking about rejoicing. It's almost uh, a continual proactive thing. Thankfulness is as God is allowing things, what should my attitude be? How should I be responding? Can I be thankful for past things? Sure. Now, as things are happening, as God is allowing things in my life, what should my attitude be? We see it right here. Should be thankfulness. Should be thankfulness. Um, it's, it's interesting that this week, um, I, I have a common situation with God where when I preach, he likes to make sure I understand really well <clears throat> what it is that I'm preaching. My wife knows this, my wife of 21 years. And, uh, and so this past week, um, let's see, I, I work in an IT department of four people, worked, in an ID department of four people, my, my boss left, one of the other developers left, and the third guy left on maternity leave. Now, for those of you who are good with math, that leaves one. Guess who that was? The Lord. <laughs> for those of you who couldn't hear, the, the response was the Lord, which is actually a very good response. <laughs> for he was with me in power. Um, so there was that. My daughter got her wisdom teeth removed. My son broke his nose. Um, anyway, at, I think at the juncture at which my son broke his nose, my wife texted me and said, what are you preaching on this week? <laughs> because all of those things, what am I, what was I being instructed to do? to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, and to be thankful in everything. Really? <laughs> and uh, that's, that's the way God works. And he says, really? You want to preach this? You better learn this. Be thankful. But, uh, but it's hard. And he says, I know, I know. But the thing is, if I remember just a few things, then it all falls into place. Daniel 4.34, I need to remember, uh, 4.35, sorry, 4.35, I need to remember that God is sovereign. God's in control. Now, that in and of itself isn't the comfort. I remember also in Psalm 139 and Ephesians 1, 7 through 10, that he is all wise. I also remember in Lamentations 3.32 and other passages that what he does is good and loving. And then I finally come to Romans 8, 28 through 30. And I remember that God is causing all things for good. So if I remember that my God is a sovereign God, and my God is an all-wise God, and my God is a loving and good God, that even through difficulty, pain, suffering, tears, hardship, I can be thankful. I can thank him because he knows exactly what he's doing. He knows exactly 
what I'm going through and he knows exactly what I need as he is working in my heart and my life to do exactly what he promised to do, which was to transform me into the image of his son. And I can be thankful. So being thankful all too often, what we're doing is we're connecting the thought of, I will be thankful if I can see the good in it. And yet God says, there's good in it. Trust me. And that's what he's calling me to do. If I'm being called to be thankful in everything, what I'm being called to do is trust God that he knows exactly what he's doing. Corey Ten Boone in The Hiding Place relates an incident that taught her always to be thankful. She and her sister Betsy had just been transferred to the worst German prison camp they had seen yet, Ravensburg. On entering the barracks, they found them extremely overcrowded and flea-infested. That morning, their scripture reading in 1 Thessalonians, want to take a guess, had reminded them to rejoice always, pray constantly, and give thanks in all circumstances. Betsy told Corey to stop and thank the Lord for every detail of their new living quarters. Corey at first flatly refused to give thanks for the fleas. But Betsy persisted and Corey finally succumbed to her pleadings. During the months spent at the camp, they were surprised to find how openly they could hold Bible studies and prayer meetings without guard interference. It was not until several months later that they learned the reason the guards would not enter the barracks was because of the fleas. So being thankful isn't us understanding the good in the immediate. And maybe never. It doesn't matter. It's us entrusting God that what he is doing is good and it's right and it's wise. And I will be thankful. Interestingly enough, I want you to think what the opposite of anger is. Most people jump immediately to peace. And, and peace is the opposite of the result or the outcome of anger, but it's actually not the opposite of anger. Because anger is when we're consumed by what we really want, what we really think things ought to be. And yet thankfulness is being thankful for what is. I want you to try and be thankful and angry at the same time. You will find that man's anger, that is, doesn't coexist with thankfulness. Tidbit, that one's for free, as Ken would say. So there's a, a last little bit of this verse at, in verse 18. It says, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I don't need to say much about that. It's, it's plainly there. Some people say, I really want to know what the will of God is for me. Guess what? And this isn't just for verse 18, in everything give thanks. It's for the whole kit and caboodle, as they say. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. All of those. For this is the will of God for you and for me in Christ Jesus. This is God's will. And God's will is one of those things that, that is mentioned actually another time in this same book. In 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Very, very clear. Our sanctification. And people like that one. I mean, it's hard. But they don't like this one because it's harder. How do I rejoice always? How do I pray without ceasing? How do I everything give thanks? That's hard. So we can agree, it's not easy. But is it possible? And either our God is very short-sighted or disconnected 
or he's given us the means. And I would say he's given us the means. He's given us his spirit. And, and thus, in 2 Corinthians, as Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That context, by the way, is about contentment, not, you know, I can jump the Grand Canyon for, quote, passage, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's ridiculous, don't do that. But his spirit does enable us to do the will of God. Why? Because it's the spirit of God the Spirit of God is never going to lead you away from the Word of God because, I don't know, he wrote it? Right? Absolutely, it's going to be in, con in total, absolute agreement. His Spirit is what enables us to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, to in everything give thanks. So let us look to him, let us rely on him. Don't sit here today and say, I'm determined to try harder, to be more thankful. I'm determined to do better in rejoicing. I'm determined to pray more often. And that's great, but you will fail. Unless you do it in submission to the spirit of God who enables all of those things. Come to him with a humble heart today. Lord, create in me this heart, a rejoicing heart, a heart that wants to commune with you, a heart that is a thankful heart. So I close with this, just a poem. O thou whose bounty fills my cup with every blessing meet, I give thee thanks for every drop, the bitter and the sweet. I praise thee for the desert road and for the riverside, for all thy goodness hath bestowed and all thy grace denied. I thank thee for both smile and frown and for the gain and the loss. I praise thee for the future crown and for the present cross. I thank thee for both wings of love which stirred my world nest and for the stormy clouds which drove me trembling to thy breast. I bless thee for the glad increase and for the waning joy and for this strange, this settled peace which nothing can destroy. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and I thank you for how it speaks to us and it is deep and wide and vast. And just like salvation, which we cannot accomplish, you have accomplished in and through your son. We come to you as a, a people with empty hands. May we rely on your spirit. And, and may you continue to take each and every person here that is yours to transform the image of your son, that we might be a people that rejoice, that have joy, that exceeds, excels, and goes past circumstances. May we be a people that praise oft and continually. May we be a people that is known for thanksgiving and thankfulness, even when in sight there is, from the world's perspective, nothing to be thankful for. We thank you for you. We thank you for your son. We thank you for your spirit, for your word, and for this time that we get to spend in fellowship together around you. Plow deep with your word. May you grow in us. It's in your name we pray.